Let's see here. There we go. Hi, I'm David Crabb, editor in chief of Workboat Magazine in New Orleans, but currently in Colorado. And today I will be talking with Jennifer Carpenter, who is the president and CEO of the American Waterways Operators based in Arlington, Virginia. And I'm going to roll right into it to talk. Jennifer was named the president and CEO on January 1st, 2020. So this is her this is her first year in that position after 30 over 30 years with AWO. So hi Jennifer. David, how are you? Happy New Year. Thanks. You too. So the first question is going to be you you probably predicted it. So you've been in the office for a year and that was a heck of a year you picked. So so the first year for you at the helm, how has it been? The good and the bad, the good and the bad. It's, it's been a wild ride, I'll tell you that. And you know, no way would I have predicted uh, in January of 2020, what we would experience over the course of a year. You know, a global pandemic, a recession, uh, the unprecedented severe weather really from coast to coast. But I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that I said to AWO members when I made the rounds back in the day when we could fly around at will uh, right. in early 2020, I said, my vision is of AWO as your indispensable organization, crucial to enabling your companies and our industry to survive, adapt, and thrive in an ever-changing business and public policy environment. And so, you know, I had no idea what their needs were going to be during this extraordinary year, but for sure we had an you know, the, the needs were huge and talk about the pace of change on both the business and the public policy front. So I think it was in some ways just a uh, an opportune time to really recommit to members uh, that we are here to help them navigate, you know, whatever is thrown at them. And we, we've done that throughout the COVID crisis and we're going to continue to do it uh, as well as continuing to help them deal with all of those issues that predated COVID and will come up after it. Yeah, I noticed that, um, Every th was it, the third Thursday of every month, you do a COVID-19 conference call. Do you, do you still do that with your members? Yeah, we do. Uh, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, we were actually getting together weekly. Uh, we've morphed over time. We've settled on a monthly rhythm now. We get together on Microsoft Teams so folks can see each other and we've got a little bit more feeling of all being in the same room. And, you know, one of the things we've seen, David, throughout this crisis is that, uh, uh, you know, there have been needs have evolved, the crisis hasn't gone away. I spoke early on about, you know, kind of the acute phase of the crisis and said, you know, now we're moving into the chronic phase. Well, one of the things we've seen, you know, in recent months is it may be the chronic phase as in a long-term challenge, but we're certainly seeing acute flare-ups. And that's something that, uh, you know, we've been just walking with our members alongside them as they've tried to grapple with that. Now, when you have these conference calls with your members, pretty much what, what have been their main concerns or what have they shared with other op operators? Yeah. The calls are great because they're an opportunity for us to make sure that members have the latest information from the federal government, from the states. They're also an opportunity for members to just ask each other questions. Hey, how are you dealing with this? So right now, I would say the issue uh, that is top of mind is vaccination and doing everything that we can to prioritize access to vaccination for mariners. Uh, we're working that issue on a variety of tracks right now. Uh, the states have had the lead on that issue. And so we've teamed with other organizations like the American Association of Port Authorities, Inland Rivers Ports and Terminals, American Pilots Association to reach out to about 25 inland and coastal maritime state governors to urge them to up the priority of mariners given their critical role in the economy as well as the really unique living and working situations that they're in. 
Um, we are also re-raising the issue with the federal government and uh, look forward to dialoguing with uh, Secretary Buttigieg when he is confirmed as Transportation Secretary and to continuing our dialogue with the Maritime Administration to see if we can't uh, develop sort of a national track for mariners who are operating in interstate commerce. You may be needing to get your shot in a place that's different from where you live. So we really think that uh, exploring a national track in addition to the state-by-state -state approach is something that uh, needs to be explored seriously. Yes, that, that was one of the questions I was gonna ask about securing, securing a uh, vac vaccination priority for mariners. But that's a, also I wanted to ask you was how you know obviously how is it going to change with more hopefully uh, more of a federal push to vaccinate all the people um, with Biden's proposal to, to throw the the full weight of the federal government behind this because it, it as you know it's a number one priority it's bipartisan because everybody knows that the quicker we vaccinate people and bring go back to some semblance of normal normality all business, the it floats the boats the, the, the tide rises on everything not just the inland barge industry but also the other sectors we cover so absolutely absolutely so you know i i would say this first of all on vaccination as an as a national priority and getting a handle on covid as a national priority that can only help our industry, right? I mean, even if the prioritization for mariners were not changed, but we were able to distribute the vaccine that much more quickly and efficiently to the folks ahead of us in line, that would help us because it would mean we'd get to our place sooner. Um, so I'm hopeful that we're going to see some progress there. But in addition to that, we are pushing hard for elevation of mariners as a priority, again, both because they are essential critical infrastructure workers and because they're living and working in close practice. Proximity. Your point about getting hold of COVID really being key to economic, uh, really the restoration of economic health is just absolutely true. Uh, one of the sectors in our industry that has taken uh, some of the biggest hits is the liquid sector, right? Which is moving less refined petroleum products as people have been driving less, people have been flying less, both for business and for pleasure that activity is just not going to return to normal until people to something you know resembling normal until people feel safe doing it and so uh getting hold of covid um is just critical to the economic restoration for our customers that will in turn flow through to the maritime industry yeah i was going to ask uh, hopefully one last COVID question. there's a lot of other subjects as you know um I think, as I said to you earlier, Pam Glass just wrote a story about your industry, how keeping is call it keep it moving, uh, and how you, how your sector has played a key role in COVID nineteen response, but also what you just said, demand for many companies, demand for their their towboats and barges has slipped, especially for energy energy related products, as the pandemic has depressed the worldwide demand for oil but and other but other barge lines that carry grain mostly for export have thrived and also another example which was early on in the in the pandemic was, is tidewater transportation out in, tra in vancouver washington where they saw the five to seven percent increase in movements of uh, finished wood products in the pacific northwest in april over the same month a year earlier. And that was due, what they said, to the surge of demand for toilet paper and paper towels. So yeah. I want to ask you is, um, how, how do you see your industry right now, business-wise, now, how are they surviving or not doing as well? I, I talked to Austin Golding, because Austin, of course, moves the energy products. He's, he's yeah. seen a depression, depression in that piece, but he has seen some increases in other areas. So what do you, what do you see right now? And then what do you see in the future for your members? Business sure one. Thing. And you know, I've used the phrase before, David, kind of the dimmer switch as opposed to the on off switch. 
the passenger vessel sector, you know, really unfortunately experienced the dramatic off switch earlier in the pandemic. One day there were cruises and the next day there weren't. For our industry, it was more of the dimmer switch, you know, as demand decreased, as uh, stockpiles um, were, uh, were not, uh, were not uh, drawn down, then demand for uh, marine transportation of some cargoes really declined. We've seen the dimmer switch dial up in some areas. You mentioned export grain, and that has certainly been a bright spot uh, this year. We had a bountiful harvest. We had robust orders for corn and soybeans, um, particularly from the Chinese. Uh, some of our uh, foreign competitors put a pause on their exports. And so that has been a real positive. Now, let's not get, you know, irrationally exuberant here. Um, I think what we're seeing is more of the market coming back into balance, because this time last year, uh, you know, we had covered hopper barges that weren't being utilized. So I don't want anybody to think that, uh, you know, it is just total boom times here. The reality is it's not. Um, but that export grain sector is certainly in, uh, is certainly seen a better uh, past few months than say the energy, the energy sector. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, transportation of, uh, uh, forest products, paper products for things like toilet paper and paper towels and, you know, Amazon delivery boxes. And, you know, absolutely that was, uh, that was, uh, was a bright spot. Uh, in some cases, uh, say the port of uh, Long Beach, we've seen uh, really robust uh, container imports because, uh, you know, we've all been ordering a lot of stuff online uh, over the last 11 months. And so, uh, you know, there have been opportunities, there have been some bright spots, um, but uh, it's been a really rough year um, for the industry. Last thing I'll say on that though is through it all, uh, companies have kept moving, They've prioritized Mariner health and safety. Uh, they have stayed on track with subchapter M compliance and implementation. So I think that really speaks highly um, of this commit industry's commitment to uh, serving its customers and serving the American public. That rolls right into uh, another question I had for you. I, I wanted to ask you about an update on uh, compliance with subchapter M and how that's going. Yeah, so the good news there is that uh, last Coast Guard statistics that I saw, the uh, multi-vessel fleets, so companies that own or operate more than one towing vessel, which were required to be at 50% of the fleet COI by last July, largely on track. Uh, the AWO members I have talked to have said, yep, we're pressing forward and, you know, we fully expect to be at 75% or higher by July of 2021. What the Coast Guard statistics do show is that portion of the fleet that is one boat operators, which were required to have that one vessel certificated by last July, are lagging. Coast Guard is digging in there to try to find out what does that really mean. Uh, are some of these boats being tied up? and they're just not gonna operate. So basically they're coming off the table or you know, are they lagging and the intent is to get them certificated and they're just behind the curve. The Coast Guard is working hard right now to try to figure that out. And certainly from an AWO standpoint, uh, our members have made tremendous investments in preparing for subchapter M implementation and compliance and maintaining compliance, um, including amid the challenging circumstances of the pandemic. So we certainly want to see robust, proactive, consistent Coast Guard enforcement. This thing's been, you know, a long time coming. Nobody, nobody gets a free pass. And as you know, they used to call it subchapter maybe. As it used to be called. Um, yeah, so here, here's my latest on that. Um, okay. Some of your uh, readers and listeners know my oldest son, Chris, uh, was born uh, in December of 2003, which was the same week that <laughs> we went to the Commandant of the Coast Guard and said, we want to work with you to do this inspection thing. Um, so uh, Chris is now 17 and starting to look at colleges. So yeah, this thing has been a long time coming. Somebody who's not ready, shame on them. So yeah, you could have said in 03 was, well, we want to work on this and I want to see it reach fruition before my son is old enough to be a decan. So. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah, we got one more year, so <laughs> we got to get it done. 
Now, another, um, we could say on the regulation front is what, what lies ahead for VITA impl implementation, which if the readers don't know, that's the Vessel Incidental uh, Discharge Act, will, which will supersede the VGP. Um, I did see that back in November 24th, AWO, you submitted a comment, 14 page uh, comment letter. So what's the update on VITA? Yeah, so my top line answer there is, it's gonna be very important to keep that rulemaking on track so that EPA and the Coast Guard uh, get final regulations promulgated uh, as the law requires. So this was a two-step regulatory process. Step one was EPA, you've got two years to come up with standards for ballast water and other discharges. Um, that clock ended in December of 2020. Then Coast Guard takes the baton. Coast Guard has two years to develop regulations specifying how do you meet those standards? Where equipment is required, what kind of equipment? How do you inspect? What do you inspect? Uh, what do you test? How do you, what kind of record keeping? What kind of reporting is required? Um, it's gonna be really important that this stays on track because until those regulations are finalized and in effect, the VGP and that patchwork of state requirements don't go away. You've always got a challenge when you go from one administration to another um, in, uh, you know, just a little, the new team has to come in and take a look at what the old team was looking at. So we're going to be working hard to make sure that VITA stays on track. I think a positive here is this is a statutorily required rulemaking. You know, this was passed by uh, bipartisan Congress that said, this is the law of the land and it needs to happen. Uh, so I fully expect that, uh, you know, the Biden administration, EPA, will continue moving forward on this and the Coast Guard will too. We just want to make sure they do that as efficiently and effectively as possible. And you're still pushing for the single national standard versus the patchwork of state regulations. That, that yeah. yeah, you know, fundamentally, David, that is just, that, that really was the, uh, central organizing principle for VITA. You know, it was this patchwork is such a problem. It's a problem for businesses that want to make investments and don't know whether that investment is going to be, you know, good in all the jurisdictions where they operate. It's important from a mariner training and education standpoint. You want to make sure your folks know what the law is wherever they operate. So a national standard, high standards, um, that everybody knows what they are and can shoot for. And then if there are, you know, areas where a uh, particular region uh, has some nuances that need to be addressed in a regionally consistent way, uh, VITA allows for that. But it gets rid of this, it, it's going to get rid of this patchwork, which has been such a problem. Now, you mentioned, obviously, the new Biden administration with the uh, regulations, but um, with Biden, uh, new Congress and Maritime, to, what, what are the challenges and opportunities you see going forward with, with the new administration? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, today is a, I'm going to start with opportunities because um, I like to start with positive and also we are, have a great development unfolding this afternoon. Uh, later today, the president is expected to sign an executive order uh, focusing on Made in America. Oh, and what right. is really awesome is that five days into his presidency, uh, that executive order is going to explicitly reaffirm his support for the Jones Act. So that is really good news for our industry, sends a very positive signal um, to uh, maritime companies throughout the country, uh, again, that they can invest with confidence, that they can look toward new markets like serving the emerging offshore renewable energy space, you know, secure in the knowledge uh, that, uh, yeah, that business is going to be, uh, you know, is going to be there for American companies, American vessels, American mariners. So that's really good. Uh, good thing number two that I would highlight, uh, infrastructure. This is an area where I'm really hopeful for bipartisan cooperation. You know, as on the Jones Act, where we've seen uh, really strong bipartisan support, infrastructure is something that, you know, 
everybody from liberal Democrats to conservative Republicans, uh, you know, can, can get behind. And so we are really hopeful and optimistic about the prospects for the Biden administration working with the 117th Congress, not only to, you know, keep biennial word of bills, uh, you know, moving forward, um, but also to uh, really uh, prioritize a large scale infrastructure package with ports and waterways infrastructure as a significant part of that. Uh, so very, very optimistic there. Um, challenges, there are opportunities and challenges with any administration. And I think the whole issue of climate change is one where there are opportunities and challenges for us. So yes, you know, maritime transportation is the most fuel efficient way to move bulk commodities, including fossil fuels. Uh, you know, they are not going away. Uh, they need to keep moving and marine is the best, the safest, the most efficient way to move them. That's good. That's something the new administration should be able to, uh, you know, recognize and like. Um, the push for decarbonization, for reduced emissions, to combat climate change, uh, that is just going to be a huge issue going forward, driven not only by the administration, by the international community, by shippers. And that's an area where our industry is definitely going to have to uh, really roll up our sleeves and engage not only on the business side, um, continually looking for uh, lower carbon, more fuel efficient ways to do things, uh, but also on the regulatory side. We need to make sure, uh, you know, that future regulations, government policies make sense uh, for marine transportation and that they're done in a in a phased and orderly way so that investments can be made and companies can recoup those investments and uh, you know we can keep vital commodities moving at the same time as we make progress toward a lower carbon future. You answered you answered all my questions almost but but uh, we laid it going back to the infrastructure bill I remember uh, maybe two or three years ago at the Work Bar Show, we had uh, a panel of, I believe, oh, we actually, one of them was from the AWO, who I forgot his name, he used to be in the North Shore. Uh, and uh, right. yeah, I think it was. We had a panel of, and we had a person from Kirby, might have been Matt uh, Woodruff, uh, AWO, talking about the infrastructure bill. And uh, and that's also something, as you know, has been traditionally bipartisan. But they were frustrated. Didn't say, I don't want to say whose name, but, but what they said, they were, they were very disappointed in the proposal at the federal government at the time, the, what, the three Ps, whatever it was. And, Public private partnerships. Yeah, right. And they said, same thing. They said, it's nonpartisan. We want an infrastructure bill which of course also includes for the upkeep of the waterways and uh, uh, improving the locks, et cetera. So with this, with Buttigieg being the next DOT secretary who's come in already in his hearing, as you know, supporting the Jones Act, I, I would, what do you think the forecast for a new infrastructure bill is? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be an optimist here because there is, I think, just no question that our country has tremendous need when it comes to infrastructure. I mean, you've everybody's heard the statistics about how old not only the locks and dams, but our bridges, our uh, water systems. I mean, you name it. It's old and there's a lot of investment that needs to be made. And it's just such a terrific investment to make right now, um, given the need to put people back to work, to pull our economy out of uh, the COVID, uh, you know, the COVID downturn. So I just think there is a lot, you know, there are a lot of stars aligning to make this a particularly good time to, uh, to work on a large scale infrastructure package. I do want to note, though, um, some real good progress that was made at the end of the last Congress. And I want to give a, a real shout out to our partners at Waterways Council um, for leading the effort to secure a change in the cost share for inland waterways construction and major rehabilitation projects in the WERDA bill that got rolled into the year end omnibus appropriations act. Uh, what that bill does is it goes from a 
50% federal treasury, 50% inland waterways trust fund match to a 65% federal treasury, 35% inland waterways trust fund match. So over the next 10 years, there's going to be an additionally potentially a billion dollars that can be spent on lock and dam construction and major rehab, which we absolutely need. And I think this is just great again, bipartisan recognition um, of the value of investment in this kind of infrastructure, which by the way, is not just about our industry, it's about the shippers and the farmers and the producers who rely on marine transportation. So we think it's really good. You mentioned the uh, past Congress um, with the Senate majority now shifting to Democrats. How do you see the uh, key committees shaping up for waterways uh, issues. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think this is where we are really fortunate as an industry uh, that we've got national scope and that we've got bipartisan friends and champions. So, you know, you look at the House and uh, what a fantastic team we've got in Pete DeFazio, the Democratic chairman of the House Transportation Committee and his ranking member, Sam Graves of Missouri. I mean, they're just, they're a dynamic duo. They've been terrific friends. At, at Senate Commerce, uh, Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi was just a stellar chairman of that committee. Um, Maria Cantwell, who will succeed him as chair from Washington State, um, is also a strong friend of the industry. I think she's going to be excellent. We heard her um, at uh, uh, Pete Buttigieg's confirmation hearing last week, uh, reaffirming her own support for the Jones Act. So I think we're, we're well served by uh, this industry's bipartisan focus, geographic reach, and we're lucky to have, when you look at the election results from last year, um, we had just a very, very high proportion of maritime champions return to Congress. Some of them are in different jobs. You know, some of our friends on the Senate side are either in the majority or the minority, uh, depending on where they were before, but they're still around. And that's a real good thing. Okay. Um... One final question, uh, I'm sure we, you have something, I have nothing else to do, of course you do, but uh, can you run through uh, AWO's priorities for 2021? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've got lots of educating of a new administration and a new Congress to do. COVID-19 is not gone just because we got vaccines. So very high on that list is working with the administration and Congress to help members manage the operational and the economic challenges associated with the pandemic. Uh, the Jones Act is always high on the list. Really great foundation that we have going into this new Congress, going into this new Congress and administration. Uh, the legislation that uh, we secured at the end of the last Congress, the National Defense Authorization Act, clarifying that offshore renewable energy is subject to the Jones Act. That gives us just a terrific foundation to work with the Biden administration. I mentioned infrastructure. So not only do we want to make sure that uh, ports and waterways infrastructure is part of a large scale infrastructure bill and partner with our, our friends at Waterways Council to make sure that we continue to have robust funding for waterways infrastructure. We need to tackle issues like construction of the next generation of Coast Guard buoy tenders and efficient utilization of the ones that are there, um, as well as the ability to surge Corps of Engineers dredges to channels to keep them open. We just, we can't afford to have any uh, sort of externalities that delay uh, the efficient movement of cargo on our inland uh, and coastal waterways. And so those are really important infrastructure issues as well. VITA implementation, get it done, make sure it is practical and truly an improvement over the VGP. Finish the job with subchapter M, get it done right. Those are, those are really at the top of the list. Well, uh, Jennifer Carpenter, President and CEO of the American Waterways Operators, we thank you for your time. Thank you so much, David. Take care. Always good talking with you. Bye-bye.